I was watching your commencement address to Michigan students a little bit earlier, and your advice to them was, always work hard on something uncomfortably exciting. So what makes you uncomfortably excited about Google right now? Boy, I was gonna, you know, I was really struck by Peter's earlier speech right before lunch. Um, he said we should live in a world of abundance. And that's not how we're thinking about it. And uh, I guess I get really excited about things we can do at Google to really seriously change the world. You know, I think we did that with search. Um, you know, we tried that with books. Uh, you know, we've tried, we tried a whole variety of things, I think, that are just, have really big change. And I'm thinking, I thought back to um, seven years ago, we started to work on maps. You know, and you think about that, that was before phones, smartphones. You couldn't really use the maps on your phone. You had to use it on a computer. We said, well, it'd be really nice to have a virtual representation of the real world that was accurate. And, you know, seven years later, we're kind of almost there. And we're excited that other people have started to notice, you know, that we've worked hard on that for seven years. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, it's kind of those big ideas that you have early. You know, I think Peter had many of those ideas. And, you know, I don't know, asteroid mining, whatever. Um, he's good at coming up with those things. But I think we're good at coming up with them in the context of our business. You know, building an open source operating system for phones before we had smartphones. Or, uh, you know, currently, probably we're doing something that all of you think is crazy. We're making self-driving cars. But, uh, you know, I have young kids. Imagine many of you do. Imagine, you know, 10 or 12 years from now, they're turning 16. How happy will you be <laughs> to have them being taught by a car? They can still drive. They think they're driving. They just can't kill themselves or anyone else. They'll still have the illusion of driving, if you like. Um, wouldn't that be a better world? And that's the leading cause of death for 16-year-olds, right, is car crashes in the US. So you just think about those kind of things. Ken, it's easy to think they're crazy now. I was wondering what your motivation was. It's clear. Um, there were a lot of questions submitted about search. Uh, so let me read this one. Um, Google is starting to compete with many of its clients in local mortgage, travel, and now automotive categories. How do you decide whether a market is already being served well by existing sites or whether it's a market that Google needs to enter? Yeah, I mean, that's always a hard question. I think if you, I just gave the maps example a little bit. I think if you think back then, you know, we had the same kind of criticisms like, oh, there's already MapQuest. Anybody heard of them? I mean, you, no one uses them anymore, I think. So there's a lot of change that happens in the industry. And uh, I think for us, we realized that location was an integral part of search. Like, you want to search for things in a given location. Uh, you want to search for a business or maybe a trail. Uh, and so for us, that was an important part of search. Like, you don't want to just search for words. You want to search for words plus locations. And that meant that we needed a high level of integration, uh, which is hard to do generally with, with third-party kinds of things. So I think many of these things are similar kinds of stuff. You know, do you want, if you type Sony digital camera, do you want a list of links uh, to other search engines? You don't think that's really right. I think you want you probably want product information, or you want to buy something. And so our job is to serve users, to serve all of you, and to do a really good job doing that. And a lot of times that requires us really answering the question and understanding deeply that underlying information. So recently I was curious, I was interested in the um, height of the San Mateo Bridge. And uh, we have these knowledge cards now and actually, Google spit back, you know, 270 feet or whatever. You know, I just got the actual answer. You know, I was kind of shocked. Because, you know, I'd hoped that we would do that for years and years, and we're finally uh, actually doing that. But to do that in a wide variety of areas, well, we need pretty deep understanding of those areas. Let me ask you one more, and then I'll go to you guys. Um, it's about hardware. 
Uh, Google with Motorola is, is now a hardware company. How important is hardware to Google? What role does it play in the overall strategy? Well, I think Android's been tremendously successful. Um, you know, we're activating you know, well over a million Android devices a day. Uh, and we're really excited about that. We've had a history of doing uh, reference devices. So, you know, we've done Nexus. You just got, I see many of you carrying around the seven inch tablet, which I really love. Uh, it's an amazing device. We designed that as a reference kind of in collaboration with Asus. So I think we're a little bit agnostic to how people get a great experience. But again, all of you as users, hopefully you're users of Google products, uh, we really want you to have a great experience. And we want to be able to innovate both on hardware and software. You know, I think back before we had smartphones, you know, we tried to get our software out to people and it was a complete disaster. Um, you know, we couldn't even get something out that would upload photos. Like carriers would say no. We had a closet of 400 different phones. We had to write specific software for each phone. It's a complete and total disaster. And you think about where we're at now, it seems much better than that. We still see tremendous opportunities for innovation uh, in hardware. You know, we have Google Glass. Sergey, my partner, is working hard on Google Glass. You know, and that's a computer that you're wearing all the time. And it's an amazing device. Uh, every time I use it, you know, I feel like I'm living in the future. You know, we're discovering things that we don't know yet about how you interact with it, what kinds of things you'll do, and really how your life will be completely changed by that. So we've got to have innovation, hardware and software at the same time, it needs to be well coordinated. I think our users are well served from us uh, taking a leading role in that, but also being practical about it. And you know, there's lots of people who are good at making hardware. We don't have to make all that hardware. Uh, we can cooperate with those people. Um, OK, right over here. Hi, Larry. Uh, Amir Afradi from The Wall Street Journal. Um, I have a, a few questions, but I'll be really, really quick. Um, you mentioned maps, and a, a bunch of my friends want to know uh, whether Google's working on an iOS uh, app for, for maps. Uh, but the two main questions that I have are kind of on the minds of shareholders right now. Um, one being whether you, you feel like Google's business is going to emerge unscathed from the uh, FTC probes that are happening in Europe and here. And secondly, everyone's very happy that uh, you're doing well in speaking again, um, but people are still curious to know, you know what's your diagnosis um, and uh, are you going to be okay going forward? Thank you. All right, I think that was three questions. <laughs> uh, so I forgot the first one already. Maps. Maps. I mean, we like people to be able to use maps. Uh, I think the, the um, question we run into, like I mentioned with the carriers, uh, when you have folks that control distribution, uh, that's not usually a great place for Google. Because uh, we like people to get our products and to get the products that we like producing. So, you know, we continue to evaluate that. We generally like people getting our products, uh, but we're not fully in control of those things on every platform in the world. Um, and there's a lot of detail that matters there too, obviously, uh, to make products viable over a long period of time and so on. Um, that said, I, mean, you know, I think it's likely, you know, you've seen all sorts of speculation about that. We'd obviously love to serve users uh, on different platforms with maps. Um, and I trust stuff. I mean, I think, you know, obviously we're very big uh, in terms of our impact. Um, I think, you know, with that comes scrutiny. Uh, we accept that uh, and welcome that. I think there's very many decisions we make that really impact a lot of people uh, and that are important questions, uh, free speech, lots of things that we do. Um, you know, I think we've had a pretty good debate with the regulators. We've taken an approach to work with them. I think that's been working. Uh, and I, you know, I'm hopeful that will continue to work well. I do think that over-regulation, kind of of the internet, and restriction in what uh, people can do uh, is a big risk for us. Um, you know, we've had a lot of debate about our privacy policy changes uh, that we did earlier this year. 
And uh, I was just struck, I was using Google Now, uh, which is a new product we have on Android uh, that's just sort of rolling out. And, uh, you know, it tells you if you search for an address and you turn on your phone, it basically shows you, like, by the way, Larry, you're going to be late. Uh, you really need to leave for that address now. It sort of connects your search to your phone, you know, gives you a notification right on the, the lock screen of your phone or the, the notifications. Super powerful. It's an amazing feature. It wasn't allowed by our previous privacy policy because uh, we weren't allowed to combine information across products. And so virtually everything that we want to do, I think, is somewhat at odds uh, with, you know, locking down all of your information for uses that you haven't contemplated yet. So, uh, you know, that's something I worry about. I think it's a very important thing. We don't actually know how the Internet's going to work 10 years from now. So it's kind of, I think, a mistake to start carving out large classes of things uh, that you don't really understand yet, uh, that you don't want to let people do. I think that's kind of the approach a lot of regulators are taking, uh, which I think is, is sad. Um, obviously, I'm here talking. Still a little hoarse, but I'm here, so I'm happy with that. Right over here. Hi, my name is Larry Adam, and my partner and I, through a company called Iconic TV, do a bunch of uh, channels for you at YouTube. So, great my name. My you, you thank have a great you. Name, thank, thank you. you. My, and my question is because we're partners, we'll be much more uh, unctuous and suck up than uh, Amir's. Um, we, part of the reason we're doing this is both Michael and I are recovering traditional media executives, and we worked in big companies like Viacom, Time Warner, and the last company I ran was owned by NBC Universal and, and CBS. And, the, 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 the slow pace with which so many of these companies in that world uh, steer their ships have partly to do with legacy and protecting what they've got, but a lot to do with um, just a, a, a lack of, I think, a, uh, an ability to do the think big, uh, or act, act big uh, and think, act small, think big. And you guys, you, for, for people like us, you move at breathtaking speed. And I'm just curious what you do both at Google and also in the way you've managed the YouTube acquisition, which I think you could look at as one of the most successful examples of somebody buying something and not screwing it up. What, what's consciously done to keep that ethos, both at the Google level and then at YouTube? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to keep things moving, and that's always a big trick. I think, for me, the key is setting really big goals. and. Uh, you know, with YouTube, I think we've had tremendous leadership, uh, both with the founders and now with Salar, who's been running it. I mean, I think they've all had a vision, you know, to really improve people's entertainment, improve access to entertainment, build a community uh, that feels really strongly about it, uh, that, you know, has free speech, that has really a great diversity, and, you know, it's a two-way medium. And what does that mean for entertainment? And so that's kind of been their their mission, and even how do we improve the world, given that most people spend most of their time engaged in entertainment, you know, looking at a screen. How do we make the world better, given we have the internet and people doing that? And that's something, you know, you can work the rest of your life on and be excited about, right? You're not just purely making money, you're also thinking about how do I make things better? I've got, you know, 20 or 30 hours a week of people's time that could really materially affect the world, right? Not just make a lot of money. And so I think, and we're not there with YouTube yet, you know, we're 10 minutes or something out of the, the 40 hours. So you can see the potential for business growth and you see the potential to do something new and different and you have a great base to build on that. But in my experience with these things is you kind of get stuck. You know, you're a car company, you make cars, uh, you know, you look at Tesla, I mean, I'm friends with Elon. You know, they're a car company with a mission to change the world and make it zero emissions. You know, that's a mission you can get further on than just being a normal car company. And again, from Peter's talk, you know, technology is with you. They've got a 30% year, 10% better every year batteries to work with. And, you know, car engines don't get better, uh, traditional ones. So think. 
A lot of times my issue is people are not setting goals that will be something that somebody who becomes rich or is, could do anything, you got to be excited about working on that for 10 years. So you got to have a big enough goal that you, know, you attract the best people and you retain them uh, and you keep them focused. And then my experience, you don't go wrong. You know, maybe you don't hit it next year, or maybe you fail entirely and you discover something more exciting to work on with the same set of people. Um, right here. Hi, Larry. Miguel Hell, Fruit Fortune Magazine. Um, the, the switch over to mobile in computing has uh, stumped a lot of companies. Um, so far, Google seems to be doing very well and obviously is leading with Android. But there's a persistent um, thinking out there among the punditry that search in mobile, um, mobile is going to affect search negatively, that people will go directly to apps and things like that. What's your, your view of the future of search on mobile? Well, yeah, I mean, we have you know, a very large app store with a lot of apps, so I think we're pretty well situated there. I think people get a little bit too hung up on those things. Uh, there's things the web does well, there's things that apps do well. Um, there's things that apps do well that the web doesn't do well, and things that the web does well that apps don't do well. And I think if we do a good job, the web will get better and apps will get better and they'll kind of be blurred. So I don't actually kind of see it that way. Um, so that kind of being said, I think that the things you do uh, on mobile, there's things you can do that you couldn't do before. So you know, the example I mentioned, you know, you turn on your phone and it tells you you're going to be late or, you know, it even notifies you of that. That's based on knowing where you are, right? And the fact that you're carrying a computer that's with you all the time, uh, which wasn't really true, you know, in the web. You know, I've got a laptop and I'm on the web kind of realm. So I think most of these things are new opportunities. Uh, and we see that, you know, if you run an ad on a phone, you know, and uh, you, you give a way for people to call, they're a lot more likely to call than they are with your laptop, right? And that's an opportunity, right? Now, every advertiser that advertises has to realize that, you know, we have, to, we have software to do that, but people need to opt into it. And uh, all those things take time. That innovation takes time. time. But there's so much opportunity based on always having a computer with you, uh, knowing where it is, uh, and so on. I think, you know, monetization is going to go up. Uh, opportunities are going to go up. Products are going to work better for people. Uh, and I think we are, I think Google's pretty good at understanding all that. So I'm very, I think that's a benefit to us, uh, not a, not a hindrance. There will be some disruption as people go through those changes. Uh, but a lot of the things we do work great on a smartphone. You know, I, I don't find my use of the web with Chrome, you know, an Android phone, to be much different from my use on desktop. So I don't see there's going to be that much disruption. And I think there's going to be tremendous benefit. We've been a little bit slow in rolling out to Chrome, to Android. So uh, there aren't that many users of Chrome yet on Android. But once you get Chrome on Android or you get other modern browsers, you can do anything on your phone you would have done with your desktop pretty well, even buying things and so on. So I think that's going to happen very quickly. Right over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Marcelo. I'm from May Mensagem in Brazil. Uh, we have just heard uh, Jeffrey talk about uh, intellectual property, and I would like to hear your side, how you think about that. Well, it's great to hear his positive reports. Uh, uh, and I certainly. Uh, I feel like we, we work together with that industry uh, better than we have in the past, maybe. Uh, that said, I think, you know, we see uh, free speech as being really important. We're seeing uh, an internet that can innovate uh, really important. And we think, in general, we should just be working with uh, content industries to solve these problems. And I think, in general, we don't see uh, regulation as a great source or legislation as a great solution for these problems. 
So I think, that being said, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. We have the Play Store. Uh, I think it's important for technology companies to cause uh, people who are making intellectual property to be successful. We've done a lot of work on YouTube uh, to let people identify their own content and monetize it. And I think those kind of things are really important. So I think we haven't quite, you know, I wouldn't say the internet yet is healthy in allowing monetization of people's intellectual property. I think the advertising models worked well, but I think the other models are not yet uh, really healthy. So again, I'm very optimistic that uh, people will be able to make more and more money from content. That will drive the creation of more content. That will benefit Google. That will benefit anyone making content. We paid out over $6 billion last year uh, through advertising. Revenue to other people uh, who make content, you know, and I love that number to be 10 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion. And I think those things are achievable. Go ahead. Hi, Larry. Pam Springer with Manta. I'm just curious um, how the workforce has changed within Google. I know your practice of 20% time allocated to people to do their favorite projects and just in general retention, you know, as things get more and more competitive. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I feel like things have gotten better. I think we've had very high retention of our people. Uh, you know, we keep getting kind of number one or place to work in the world and so on. So I think we're doing something right there. And for me, it comes back to what I said earlier, just about setting uh, really important goals, making sure we're setting goals high enough that people really want to come into work in the morning and they believe in what the company is doing and they believe that our ethics are sound and their morals are right and we're, we're also trying to make the world better in addition to making our business bigger and better. Um, I think, you know, we're in a very competitive environment, but I think we've been really happy with our ability to do that. I think we try to treat our employees as owners and as part of our family, and I think that's been really powerful too. I mean, it sounds stupid, but just free food, you know, people really trying to treat people how you think they're going to be treated 10 years from now. Right, and my grandfather was an auto worker, you know, and I have still have a um, a lead a hammer that he would carry to work every day to protect himself from the company, right, that he worked for. You know, I don't think that's Google. Uh, <laughs> that's two generations, right? So what will the next generation be? And I think hopefully, uh, you know, I believe in a world of abundance as Peter was saying, and in that world, many of our employees don't have to work, right? They're pretty wealthy. Uh, you know, they could probably go many years without working. Why, why are they working? They're working because they like doing something, they believe in what they're doing. And I think that's what the future world's gonna be like, hopefully. And so I, I believe we wanna get ahead of those trends and drive those trends, uh, not follow them. So you want every worker you have to have the choice not to work uh, and to do whatever they want to do, but they want to work for you because they believe they're doing something great and important. So that, that's what you should want. That's like uh, Henry Ford wanting every employee to be able to buy a car, right? We want every employee to be able to do anything, but we want them to still work for us. Hey, Larry. Uh, Chris McCann from 1-800-Flowers.com. One of the areas of change really taking place right now is around payments. And so I'm just interested in your longer-term vision of Google Wallet, but really just overall Google as a facilitator or what's Google's role in payments? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I think, obviously, you know, you're carrying a phone, and that's the right way to do payments. So we've been working hard on that. Um, uh, Google Wallets really provides an amazing experience. Like, people have Google Wallets working on their phones. I mean, they'll just, they'll sit for five minutes and they'll rave about it. You know, I don't have to carry a credit card anymore. I can tell when something's charged. It's more secure. It's just an amazing experience. 
So I think it's pretty clear how everything will go that way. And furthermore, you know, coupons and offers and all those things are going to be managed for you uh, in a lot more useful way. So I think, I think again, your life's going to be changed by how you buy things. And that's something we're really working hard on. And I think, you know, five years from now, if, you know, if, I don't think I could totally tell you all the changes that are going to be made, but I can tell you your life will be changed and that buying things will be a lot more seamless and a lot faster, uh, and it'll be a great experience. Anybody? We have a couple more minutes, so I have a couple more. If, uh, All right. And if don't you be do shy. have another question, yeah, don't be shy. Just move up to the mic, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll make time for you. Um, this one is about education. Um, since Google has effectively become the global encyclopedia, how does it fit into the transformation of research and um, of learning in education? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we kind of view as our core mission. So, you know, even with search, uh, you know, we've said for a long time, if you were the perfect search engine, you would understand everything in the world. You know, you'd be like kind of a librarian, but they knew everything. Um, You'd understand when you type a query or when we know more about you, uh, we know, we understand deeply what you want. And we gave you that exact right thing. And uh, that requires basically being smart. It requires knowing everything in the world and understanding what you want and your context. You know, where, where are you in the world? Are you uh, Marie Galman or Lisa Randall with respect to physics or are you me? Right, who knows nothing about physics. You know, when they type a query versus you typing a query, hopefully you get different things, right? Um, there's a really different level of understanding. So I think, you know, for education, as well as almost everything else we do, similar set of needs. We just want to really empower you to just be able to do amazing things, to learn things that, you know, before it would take you days or years to learn, maybe it takes you five minutes or a minute now uh, to learn those things. I think that's having a huge effect on the world and its productivity, and I think it's going to have sort of a ever-increasing benefit to the world and education. Personally, on education, I think we think about it a little bit too static. You go to school, you're educated for 20 years, uh, you leave school, and then you don't do any education, you just do your job, maybe learn a few things. Um, I think it'd be better if it was more of a continuous cycle. Um, people could learn new things, they could switch careers. Um, there's lots of people in Silicon Valley very excited about, you know, getting people certification that they like know how to do something, you know, just purely online. And there's certainly some number of people that will work for. So, you know, when I was at Stanford, I just watched all my classes on video because uh, that's how the computer science department did it. They recorded everything. So I would watch. I'd never go to class. You know, the day before the exam, I'd watch all my classes. And then hopefully I'd pass the exam. And it uh, worked pretty well for me. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that works for everyone, but it works for a lot of people. And it's very, very cheap. Uh, to provide education that way can be provided to anyone in the world sort of on an equal basis at almost no cost. So I do think there's going to be tremendous changes that happen in, in, in education. I think if you wanted an electrical engineer, quote unquote, that person could be certified fully online, could be an amazing employee, and that could be done at almost zero cost. So that's exciting and it's disruptive for normal kinds of educational things. I'm a big fan of traditional education, too. I don't think we should just like shut it down. But I do think there's tremendous opportunities for using technology to improve that uh, and to really change what people do. Here, here. Somebody stood up, yes. Yeah. Uh, I love the cont contextual world that you're trying to bring us with the Google Project Glass and stuff like that. Uh, Bill Gates sold me a tablet PC and got me really excited about tablet PC. And it was 
not Microsoft that made that a mainstream product for a whole lot of reasons that Steve Jobs and you have improved with this Nexus 7 that we got. It's a beautiful product, I agree with you. Where um, a big part of context is who we're with. And unfortunately, in my life, most of my who we're with and what are we doing together is on a non-Google server somewhere. How do you think Google is going to attack that with this Google Glass, the Project Glass, where we're going to want to know things about who we're with and what we're doing and what the intent of that group is? Yeah, I think that's a very insightful question. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think hopefully if the internet works well, there'll be a lot of services that uh, do amazing things based on where you are and who you're with. And fundamentally, um, for a computer, you know, that's not a very hard thing, right? That's like some small amount of data somewhere. So I think hopefully there'll be a lot of services and people uh, who really use that data and who really provide it for a whole variety of amazing and interesting services. Um, and I think you know the example I mentioned about Google Now, about just knowing about where you're going and when you know when you need to leave to get there. You know, that's a really simple example, but in order to do that, we know all those things. So I think that uh, that's something that's going to change your life uh, in really meaningful ways. Uh, and I think you'll see almost unimaginable number of services and applications that just use that kind of data, where you are, who else is there, what are they doing, uh, and so on. And I think computers aren't doing a good job of that now. Like, um, your, your phone doesn't know that this is not a good time to interrupt you. Right? I mean, that's almost a trivial thing to know. But again, for us, you know, solving that actually required changing our privacy policy, right? which we've now done. And you'll now see those kinds of things roll out. Uh, but that's why I'm, you know, I'm keen to see the innovation happen on the internet and for amazing things to happen that really empower you uh, as an individual. It's a lot of the things that you're spending time on now, you know, managing your life, managing your schedule, uh, managing, thinking of queries to do to Google. You know, Google now, we're telling you, these are things you're interested in. You, know, you when you turn on your phone to check what's the exchange rate, Google now just tells you what it is, right? So you know how much cash to get out of the ATM, right? Because you don't know, like, do I get out ten thousand dollar, ten thousand riel, or five thousand, or whatever the number is? When you turn on your phone, it just tells you that, because it knows that's what you want. So I think um, there's a lot of things we've spent time doing today that we'll be able to automate and be able to make really a lot better uh, than we do now. Uh, real quick, do we have one more? Yeah, right, right over here. Step up to the microphone. Uh, no. uh, oh, she might, she, yeah, she beat you to it, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> this is our future. <laughs> you can line up, the company we line up. Okay, so I'm Brittany from the Google Science Fair, and I was wondering how you thought the role of the emerging social media would impact the future search algorithms? Yeah, well, I think it's really important to know, again, who you're with, uh, what the community is. Uh, it's really important to share things. It's really important to know the identity of people so you can share things and comment on things and improve the search ecosystem you know, as you, as a real person. And uh, so I think all those things are absolutely crucial. That's why we've worked hard so hard on Google Plus, on making an important part of search. Again, like maps, we don't see that as like something that's like a separate dimension that's never going to play into search. When you search for things, you want to know what kinds of things your friends have looked at, or recommended, or wrote about, or shared. I think that's just kind of an obvious thing. So I think, you know, in general. I think if the internet's working well, uh, the information that's available will be shared with lots of different people and different companies and turned into experiences that work well for everyone. You know, Google's gotten where it is by 
searching all the world's information, uh, not just a little bit of it, right? And in general, I think people have been motivated to get that information searchable, because then we deliver users uh, to those people with information. So in general, I think you know, that's the right way to run the internet as a health ecosystem. I think social data is obviously important and useful for that. Uh, we love to make use of that uh, in every way we can. Do we have time for one more, real yeah. quick? Do you? I'm Dan, I'm Dan Dubner. Um, are you having fun? And if so, where are you having the most fun? Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I think that, um, I feel that we have tremendous, as a company, we, can, we have tremendous positive impact on the world, and we are involved in a lot of important stuff and trying to guide it in a good direction. Um, you know, if you look at, obviously, there's a lot of controversy over the YouTube uh, Muslim videos and all this kind of stuff, and I think, you know, we have some principles about that and we stick with them. Um, I think that's an important thing for the world. Um, and I, so I think that's fun. It's hard. You know, it's not that it's not a hard thing to do, uh, to navigate through all those kinds of things, but it's also very rewarding. And I think it's important. And I think we have a somewhat of a social mission, uh, which most other companies do not. Again, I think that's why people like working for us why people like using our services. So I think it's a win-win for us, but it's somewhat unique uh, in corporate culture. Um, I think also for me, I think I see a lot of impact uh, that I'm having, just making sure we're setting long-term goals and really executing against those. You know, when we started, when we bought Android as a company, it was about 12 people. There were no smartphones. We were pretty sure that was the right thing to do. That was not obvious to most people. So I think we're making a lot of bets like that, which I think will add a lot of productivity to the world, a lot of benefit to the world. And frankly, I don't see a lot of other people willing to make those kind of investments in kind of things that people think are more risky, long-term things. In my experience, they're not that risky. Uh, I think we have a pretty good track record on them. Uh, and they're also not that costly. Um, so for me, that's very powerful because I feel we have a lot of resource to do that. And we have a lot of execution capability uh, to really make things real. It's a great question to end on, Dan. Yes. Uh, Larry, thank you for letting us grill you. Yeah, it's thank been all fun. Of you for thank you, everybody.